All right, uh, this morning I would like to speak to you this morning. This morning, I would like to speak to you this morning about uh, God enlarging your world. So let me start again. The title of this morning's message is, Let God Enlarge Your World. Um, I've been carrying this message in my spirit for some time now, and uh, I felt that it was time for it to come out. And for those of you that, uh, that might say, well, that's really not very much different to what Pastor Vanessa has been speaking about in the last few weeks uh, with a message entitled, Take the Limits Off, you're exactly right. This is a continuation of what Pastor Vanessa started some weeks ago, and didn't she do a great job? Uh, last three weeks. In fact, last week I was so concerned, I thought, oh, gee, she's preaching better than me now. She might end up getting my job, and I might end up <laughs> losing my job. So I was almost a bit nervous. In my, I'm, I'm even sweating right now in palms of my hands and everything. And, oh, <laughs> I tell you, last week that message, if you weren't here and you didn't get the, you really need to get that audio recording. It was just like top shelf stuff. It was like the whole series was fantastic, but for me, last week was like absolutely just, just out there. And so <laughs> praise God <laughs> for my girl doing just a wonderful job. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> praise God. All right. <laughs> Well, um, I would like to start by reading the uh, passage of Scripture here that's on the top of the outline and also on the screen behind me. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Uh, and there it says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. And the passage, just one verse, and of course there's verses preceding that and one or two following that, but just for the sake of our study this morning, I just want us to, to pluck that verse out uh, and to have a look at the, is what's actually in there. It's basically telling us that God's placed a power within every believer, that God's power is at work on the inside of us. And that power really uh, wants to break forth, it wants to break out, and it wants to break down every barrier uh, uh, in our lives that holds us down. And I'll be speaking about and identifying some barriers that are people experiencing in their lives that are holding them back. The power of God is stronger than those barriers. But if you are clinging on to the barriers and not availing yourself of the power of God, you will continue to be held down. God does not want us to be scratching with the chickens. God wants us to soar with the eagles. And uh, so again, the title of today's message is, Let God Enlarge your world. Uh, God really wants to enlarge our world by removing everything, every barrier, every limitation, every thought for that matter that uh, holds people down. And I suggest to you that many people's world is way too small way too small. And, and, and some people have got a very small world. Uh, I met an, an old acquaintance friend of ours uh, a number of months ago, and we got chatting, and, uh, and uh, we had a good time, but I came away from that. I thought, gee, his world has become very small. And uh, you know, some people's world is, is very small. The trouble is they don't know it. They don't know that there is something beyond the borders and beyond the limitations that they've come to accept, limitations they don't, they don't even see anymore. They're just always there. Many people have had a small world forced upon them, even during their upbringing. And, you know, to a certain extent, it's good to train kids. Uh, but, you know, many people, all they've heard is, don't touch this. Don't go there. Don't do that. And they've grown up with that. It's like, oh, I'm just, you know, the, like the, the world's closed in on them and barriers and, and fences have closed in on them and have become very, very small. They've become a little bit like the proverbial fleas in the matchbox. How many of you have heard the story about fleas in the matchbox? You haven't heard that story? Well, let me tell you that fleas are able to jump 300 times their own height into the air, like absolutely amazing. Fleas are only tiny little things, but they're able to jump 300 times their own height into the air, which is about, they tell us about uh, uh, 10, 12, 15 inches, could be about 20, uh, 30 centimeters uh, two to three hundred millimeters for those of you that work in millimeters and absolutely amazing but it's been found that if you place uh, fleas into a matchbox and close the close the matchbox up that after a while they try to jump as high as what they did before and they keep on heat, hitting their head and you leave them in there for a few days and when you bring them out afterwards and watch them jump they will jump no higher than about one uh, you know, 15 to 20 uh, millimeters which is what they got used to inside that little box 
And uh, imagine, imagine if you could jump 300 times your own height. Uh, for those of you that are quick with maths, uh, wouldn't that be if somebody was, say, 1.5 meters tall? Imagine jumping, uh, what would that be, some, uh, some of you uh, experts in, in, in maths? And you just imagine just, phew, just jumping high. Uh, well, we're not talking about jumping physically, but I'm telling you that there's some room for you to rise up a little bit more, and there's for, some room for you to expand out a little bit more. God has not placed you inside a small world, and God wants to break some people's matchboxes today. Absolutely rip the whole thing apart, and God will do it through the preaching of the Word. God will do it as you rip out and suddenly begin to identify that you have actually been matchboxed in and that you're tired of it. You don't want it anymore. You no longer fit into that matchbox today. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20, same passage of scripture. Let me read it to you from the Amplified translation, which just expands things and amplifies things out just a little bit. It says, now to him, uh, and by the way, this is talking about God. In case some of you were wondering when we were worshiping and singing to him this morning, uh, the one who is awesome and wonderful, we were actually worshiping Jesus Christ, all right? just in case somebody's confused about that. So again, this is speaking about God. It says, to him who in uh, consequence of the action of his power that is at work within us is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly, not just abundantly, but super abundantly, far above, and, and I start again, far over and above all that we dare ask or think infinitely uh, beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, or dreams. Do you see any limitation in there? I don't. All right, God's taken the limits off. God wants to enlarge our world. And wherever you are right now in your world, friend, there is more. And whatever barriers and bondages and, uh, and things that you somehow, limitations that you got used to that are just there, you don't even think about them anymore. You just got used to them. God wants to tear them down and enlarge your world. And God wants to do it today. Uh, or certainly make a good thing in this thing that over the next few days and weeks and, and months that suddenly when you look back from, from uh, this coming year into, into this year, it's like, oh, I wonder what that was all about. But God has done marvelous things in my life. Some of you, you have experienced what I'm talking about today. It might just not have been articulated to you in this way. Uh, but you no longer fit into the box that you sat in two, three, five years ago. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. So friend, wherever you are right now, there is more. And I'm speaking to every single person in this house. This message here is not just for the people in the front row, it's for everybody. I'm speaking to you folk in the back row and everybody in between, all right? Okay. And by the way, am I loud enough? Can you all hear me? I want everybody to hear me. I've got some very important things to say today, all right? God can and God wants to do super abundantly, far above and beyond uh, uh, all you can dare to ask, to think beyond your highest prayers. How many of you pray big prayers, like bold, like out there prayers? Well, God can top that. God can go way beyond that. Uh, above your desires, how many of you got big desires? And by the way, there's nothing wrong with having holy desires, good desires. All right. Thoughts. Sometimes when we think about big things, God can top that. God can go beyond that. Uh, it says hopes and dreams. And, uh, you know, in that respect, I remember uh, one nightmare that I had as a, little, as a little boy when I grew up, when I was little, and, and, and of course I'm huge now, but back then I was only a little guy. And one reoccurring nightmare that I had was that there, I can't put it all into words, but there was just a, a whole lot of nothing, and, 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 and there was a cloud at the top, and I was under that cloud, and I just couldn't get my head above that cloud. Uh, I'm not doing a very good job in describing what it was like, uh, but it, it's it's along these lines, and, uh, and that was a nightmare that just happened uh, at, at various times, and I woke up, and I absolutely hated it, um, and uh, some people live in, the, in that nightmare all the time. They can never get their head above the cloud. They can never, there's always just a cloud of, of what have you, of can't do it, or, or a cloud of oppression, a cloud of you're no good, a, a cloud of condemnation, uh, uh, a cloud of you're a mistake and you shouldn't have happened, uh, and, and what have you. God wants, wants to remove that cloud. God wants to, to lift you above it and stick your head through that thing and never go back under again. 
I just reminded of our little uh, publication that we brought out some years ago called the New Believers Handbook uh, with the cartoon um, uh, front page of it. How many of you can picture it where this little guy, like God grabs him by the scruff of the neck and sort of lifts him over the pit of hell and now that he's saved. And that was the whole idea when, when we got saved, God picked us up. And you know, God wants to pick some people up by the scruff of the neck and lift them above that cloud. And, 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 and never drop you, not drop you uh, down again. The Bible, God says it, God is not the one who drops us. God, the Bible says that God is the glory and He's the lifter of our head. God doesn't slam people down. It's the devil that pushes people down. It's the devil that closes in on them and leads people into bondages and leads people into condemnation that there's always a cloud of condemnation over them. Not good enough, not good enough, not good enough. Friend, when Jesus died on the cross and He shed His blood and when we have availed ourselves of that forgiveness of sins, it's now good enough. All right? We didn't commit good enoughness. We were made good enough. Praise God. And that was the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Let me read to you from Romans chapter 5, verse 2. It just articulates what we are talking about so well, particularly in the message translation. It says, We throw open our doors to God. Uh, in other words, we open up our heart to God and allow God to come in. Uh, and by the way, that's a good thing to do. Uh, if anybody wants uh, to be saved, if anybody wants to have their sins forgiven, you've got to throw your doors open to God uh, and let Him come in. So it says we throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that He's already thrown open His doors to us. God's doors are already open. All right. In fact, the very deal when Jesus died on the cross, and the Bible tells us that there was this temple there in a place where uh, the, supposedly the presence of God dwelt was separated from a thick curtain that was several feet high, a thick curtain. And the Bible says when Jesus died on the cross, that curtain was ripped from top to bottom, not from bottom to top, but from top to bottom, signifying that the doors to God are open. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. The Bible says no one comes to the Father except through Him. And by the way, that curtain, and I've said this before, but that curtain was so thick thick it was made of, of material so thick that human hands would not have been strong enough to tear it up but God grabbed this thing from the top and absolutely ripped it open to signify that his doors are open and by the way they were opened 2,000 years ago and they haven't closed yet all right so all the same time the same moment he says we discover that God has already thrown open his doors to us we find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory, standing tall and shouting our praise. God wants you to stand tall, my friend. Once you get saved and Jesus Christ comes into your heart, then you can stand tall. You can shout the praises of God there. It says he is standing, it says, in God's wide open spaces of his grace and, in, and his glory. Now, we know that that is a spiritual place, if you like, but it is in God's will for us to stand in the spiritual world of the wide open spaces of His grace and in and His glory, and then you end up living in a dinky little world naturally. It is just not God's will. All right, God wants us to live in the world, uh, in a big world, spiritually as well as naturally. So, my friend, live a big dream, yeah. pursue a big vision. I suggest that for most people in this auditorium. The vision that you have for your life is too small. God wants to expand that thing out, and that'll be a good place to start. You can go beyond where you had hoped you would go. Yeah. Tragically, you know, we got, we got kids at school uh, in some places, and, uh, and uh, in some, some places, and, you know, their only ambition is to come out of school, to do the last year of schooling, and sometimes even leaving early, only to be able to get on the dole so that they've got a little bit of money coming in, the government could, can look after them, and then just live the rest of their lives like this. In some places around the world, we've got second and third generation of welfare people, and this is not about giving people a hard time that rely on welfare now, but God wants to lift you above that. All right, God wants to expand your world. He really does. Uh, so lift your expectations. God has expansion on his mind for every believer. You know what expansion means? That when you've got a, um, a house and the house gets too small and you add on, you build another room or two or something, you're, you're, you're what's the word for it? Uh, extension, uh, extension, expansion. 
God's got extension and expansion on his mind for your life. Praise God. God's got extension and expansion in his, on his mind for this church right here. You know, we've been talking for some time uh, about, you know, that there is a mandate on this church to reach 3,000 people in our region here. And, uh, and I, I just, my lightning quick mind just did a quick maths the other day. Uh, actually, I'm lying. Uh, I really went to my little calculator. And, uh, you know, there are 300,000 uh, 300, people uh, in our region, approximately. And I worked out that that's only 1%. That we believe in God for 1%. And I thought we have to lift our vision. <laughs> and look way beyond that. And we are. It's just good to sort of put a goal there for now and praise God. That's what we're doing, uh, just reaching out uh, and uh, to get people saved and to get them established in the good, in the good uh, uh, plan of God for their lives and to teach them the word, to teach them how to walk by faith and uh, to live a life that is committed to God. God has expansion on his mind for every single believer. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. Again, it's using language there. Uh, Paul's writing to the Corinthian church there. He says, Dear, dear Corinthians, I can't tell you how much I long for you to enter this wide open, spacious life. Hello. <laughs> Evidently, they were a bit closed in. Evidently, they needed to have their, their world enlarged a little bit. Paul says, Look, he says, I can't wait. He says, I want you to enter into this wide open, spacious life. We didn't fence you in. The smallness that you feel comes from within you. And isn't that interesting? That smallness doesn't come from without, it comes from within. And though I mentioned earlier on that some people have been slammed down as young kids, you know, don't do this, don't touch that, don't go there, don't try this and everything else. And suddenly the world became very small. But at a certain point, smallness is within. All right? Uh, it's smallness is not without. Uh, you know, there's a, a saying that they use, the world's your oyster. And by the way, if you develop an international sort of a perspective on, on life, and more of a global deal, your world will already grow larger. Some people have hardly ever moved out of their little suburb that they were born in, gone to school in, had, had their job in, uh, had their, uh, you know, everything has always happened in that one tiny little place. And so thinking globally, internationally, will already lift your, 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 your just will enlarge your world a little bit. By the way, history is a good thing too. When we understand history, uh, it enlarges is our world. When we understand more than just the here and now and the present, uh, it's just a good thing to enlarge our world in this way. The smallness, he says, that you feel comes from within you. In other words, Paul says, I didn't place it on you. God didn't place it on you. It's from within. He says, your lives aren't small, but you're living them in a small way. Wow, what articulation of what we're talking about. Our lives aren't, aren't, aren't small, but some of us are living them in a small way. All right. I'm speaking as plainly as I can and with great affection. Open up your lives. Live openly and expansively. All right. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Just what, what words? Uh, how awesome is that? So the Corinthian church, of course, uh, was a bit of a squabbling church. They were fighting. There was infighting going on. There was gossip. And by the way, gossip, gossiping people are all very small-minded people. Um, and, uh, and, and that's why we don't gossip in this church at all. All right. Because we're much bigger than that. Okay. Um, and, uh, and if you gossip, I would love to talk to you and expand your mind a little bit, <laughs> letting you know that we don't do that here, all right? We're much bigger than that, praise God. So <laughs> he says, live openly and expansively. Uh, break out. Uh, allow the power of God within you to bust down some of these barriers uh, and some of them which I will identify just a bit later on. Uh, again, as we read through the Word of God, as we read through the Bible, you know the Bible is really full of unlimiting uh, statements and promises. And when I say unlimiting, uh, God's placed no limitation on us. Uh, uh, sure, God says, you know, don't, don't get into, into breaking my commandments. God placed Adam and Eve into a beautiful garden. He says, you're able to just eat, eat everything and, and, and everything. Just don't touch that one tree. And, uh, and uh, don't touch the fruit off of that one tree. And you know, there's certain, certain fruit for us that is forbidden fruit. Uh, if it breaks God's commandments, then don't touch it. But God's placed a, a big and a large world and, 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 and we can do so many things that are absolutely fine and absolutely wonderful for God and, 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 or with God. And so 
We just need to know what they are. So the Bible is full of unlimiting statements and promises. There's one right here. We sometimes refer to it when we talk about tithes and offerings. In Malachi 3.10, and again, this is the message translation that just uses modern language to, to, to uh, uh, bring the word of the Lord in, in, in today's terminology. Bring your full tithe to the temple treasury so there will be ample provision in my temple. Test me in this and see if I don't open, the heaven, uh, open up heaven itself to you and pour out blessings beyond your wildest dreams. What are your dreams? All right. What dreams do you have uh, in different areas of your life? What dreams do you have financially? God wants to go beyond your wildest dreams. And of course, that's why we talk about tithes and offerings. It's one of the ways that God uses to get us there. Uh, so we can live our dream uh, and, and, and move into this big world that God has for us financially and every other way. So this is an unlimiting statement. Um, and, uh, and there is another one here in Exodus chapter 3, verse 8. God speaking uh, about the Israelites that were by now in, in Egypt in bondage. They were enslaved. Um, and they had a hard taskmaster over them, just ex ex exacting uh, uh, slave labor from them. God says, and now I've come down to help them. If you are in some sort of enslavement, God wants to help you. He really does. God hasn't placed you there. God does not place us into difficult spots and into uh, oppressive situations. He says, pry them loose from the grip of Egypt. Uh, Egypt is a type of the world today. When the Bible speaks of Egypt, it's a type of the world. When the uh, Israelites came out of Egypt into the promised land, uh, New Testament language today, when we, we come out of the world, we get saved, we come into the kingdom of God. Uh, God has pried us loose from the grip of the world. Um, and, uh, and he says here, pry them loose from the grip of Egypt Get them out of their country and bring them to a good land with wide open spaces, a land lush with milk and honey. Don't you love that language? He says there, he says, uh, um, he says, uh, take them out of their country. Friend, if that country that you're in right now, and I don't mean a physical, literal country, but I'm, I'm talking about your world. If that country is too small, and it is, by the way, even if your country is pretty big already, there is a bigger one waiting to be occupied. God wants to take you out of that and knock down those borders. Um, and in fact, it's interesting. In New Zealand, we have no borders. All we have is coastline, and that's a bit of a physical barrier. But you know, in places in Europe where I grew up, you know, they've got borders, and every few years those borders shift a little bit uh, you know after the second world war there was a major redraw of the borders there and you know borders can move borders can be shifted and if there's a border in your life it can move it doesn't have to stay there God's power is strong enough and powerful enough to bust that thing down and to knock it out of the way so you can cross over and enjoy a bigger life does that am I preaching to the right crowd here today Hallelujah, praise God. Bring them into a good land with wide open spaces, a land lush with milk and honey. Um, by the way, prosperity is from the Lord. Uh, milk and honey speaks of the good things in life. Uh, you know, milk s speaks of the necessary things, and honey spe speaks of the, of the sweetness of life. You know, we use expressions that so and so and so, and we say, sweet, you know, sweet. Uh, and, you know, sweet is, is cool, um, and cool is sweet. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> God wants us to have a cool life that is sweetened with just the blessing of the Lord, with abundance, with blessings, and everything. God doesn't box us in, my friend. Paul says to the Corinthian church, I didn't fence you in. God didn't fence you in. You fenced yourself in a little bit. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, religious thinking fence us in. Uh, and I hate religion. I hate religion with, with a vengeance. I, I got a lot of that when I grew up, and I don't want no more. I just, I can see it when I, when I see it. I can recognize it. I can smell it when I'm near it. Religion is a horrible thing. Now, of course, you know, they, they refer to Christianity as a, ritual, as a religion, and they talk about various other world religions, and I understand that term. But for us, Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you know, there, are, there is religion that wants to always home in on people and push them down. In fact, some weeks I've got a message stirring in my spirit about religious spirits who are pretentious spirits, uh, and they're not from heaven, they're from hell. And religious spirits 
come on people's lives, even Christian people's lives, and 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 to 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 you know hold, just in you know to narrow down their world and to narrow down the world of people around them. They do it through condemnation and through other horrible things. And so, in some time to come, we'll be bringing that message up and and bring it out because we need to recognize what's happening and the fact that we are moving more and more into revival and you're getting deeper and deeper into the river of God. It's history has proven that when you. You know, when the, the presence of God gets stronger and everything, it's not just, uh, it's not just uh, the angels that come and rejoice with everything that's happening. You know, the Bible says when one sinner repents, there is a party in heaven. The angels rejoice. And, uh, you know, we're here today, but there's angels all around us listening to the word of the Lord and amongst themselves shouting, better amen than what you do. All right, so please help me a little bit this morning. Praise God. But, you know, not only does it draw... The angels of God, but it also draws demon, demon spirits. And some of them are religious spirits. They are pretentious devils that pretend to be good, uh, that pretend to love God, but they hate God and they hate God's people. And we need to recognize uh, uh, what they look like. So if they turn up, we can deal with them. We've had a few of them come through occasionally. Um, and <laughs> praise God. I'm getting a bit sidetracked here this morning. Let me read to you from Isaiah chapter 54. Um, that was a, 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 um, a scripture here that really, really helped me in enlarging my world years ago. Uh, here in Isaiah 54, verse 1, it says, Sing, O barren, you who have not born. So in other words, uh, 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 it, it speaks about women that are unable to bear children. It says, Sing, you who have not born. Break forth into singing and cry aloud. You who have not labored with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. And you know, God is able to do amazing things. If there is a limitation there, you know, there were a number of, of uh, barren women uh, in the Bible. Sarah was one of them, Abraham's wife, and she was just unable uh, to have children. Yet God had promised to Abraham that he was going to be the father of many nations and had promised to, to Sarah that she was going to be, you know, the mother of, uh, of a multitude and everything. And, uh, and, uh, but she was barren. Uh, and there was Rachel, you recall, uh, one of Jacob's uh, wife. Uh, was it Jacob or... or um, Whoever, anyway, <laughs> praise God. And she was barren. And there was Hannah. You remember Hannah uh, that gave birth to Samuel? Well, Hannah was barren, and she cried aloud, and she cried to the Lord, and God visited every one of these women. And suddenly, when there was a limitation, God removed all of that. When there was barrenness and desolation, God turned it into population. He just populated their house, <laughs> and Sarah populating the whole the whole world in terms of the Jewish race. And 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 how awesome is that? So, you know, God wants to do that. God wants to visit people and remove their barrenness. Um, he, wants to, he, he wants to just absolutely remove any barrier and any hindrance that's there. Notice verse 2. It says, enlarge the place of your tent. Now, nowadays we live in houses. Um, but back then they lived in tents. And, you know, tents were typically had, uh, had poles as they do today, many, many of them. In fact, the modern ones don't have poles anymore. They've just got arches. But back, the, back then, they had poles, and they had stakes on, on the outside. And uh, he says, enlarge the place of your tent. Let them stretch out the curtains of your dwelling. And so, in other words, he says, stretch the curtain material out a bit more. Make a bit more room inside. He says, do not spare. I, I always remember that word. It just did something in my spirit. Do not spare. When you lift your vision and you expand out and you, you suddenly realize you can go beyond. I tell you, when I grew up as a little guy, I felt so hemmed in and so closed in. I grew up in a valley, um, not as, as large as the Hutt Valley, but in a much smaller uh, valley, there was a steep hill in front of us and a sloping hill uh, behind us. And to go up to school, I had to climb up this hill um, uh, every, every morning. This, uh, we started school at uh, s uh, seven years of age, I think, six or seven, not as they do here at five, and, and had a big 
backpacker on the Berkeley my way up this hill and struggling in winter time. You know, one step forward and two steps back in the winter time and there's snow. But anyway, I did get to the top every time. And, and when I got to the top of that hill, suddenly it all opened up and, and I saw into the distance and I saw other hills and I've always wondered. I thought, what's behind that next hill over there? There was always something that stirred in my spirit. That place was way too small uh, for me. And I don't mean to sound arrogant, but the country that I was in, I, I hope I don't sound arrogant, but it was just all too small. And, and there is a uh, there's sometimes uh, with, with, with some of these people that have lived there generation after generation after generation there's almost like a locked inness that, uh, that we might not fully appreciate even in this country New Zealand is a new country and Vanessa talks about it when we get back to the country of my birth and she says it's all just a bit all just a bit closed in throw off those yokes and, and don't let anybody close you in no matter where you live it doesn't matter which physical country, country that you live in God wants you to experience another hill and the one beyond that and completely enlarge your world. So enlarge the place of your tent. Let them stretch out the curtains of your dwelling. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords. So they had these cords there on the outside that, and the stakes in the ground. He says, make those cords longer. He says, uh, uh, and strengthen your stakes. Just rain them in, into the ground a bit, a bit deeper for, for, for uh, you know, just holding down a bigger tent. God wants you to have a, a bigger tent. He says, for you shall expand to the right and to the left. I like that too. <laughs> so in other words, there is no boundary, uh, no limitation on the left. There's none on the right. God says, you shall expand to the right and to the left, and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. So there were desolate cities there. God says, they shall be inhabited. You just start, just build one other room in your tent, and then another room, and then build another tent. And next minute, you go, you got a whole village of tents. And next minute, you know, you're just, you're just going to uh, just completely break forth. And you see, this is what happens. And I'm kind of using figurative language here. Uh, in terms of tent, but when Jesus Christ comes into our lives, and when we become doers of the word, barrenness turns to fruitfulness, desolation turns to population, smallness turns to largeness, and limitation turns to expansion. This would be a good place to shout amen or hallelujah or something. I can hear the angels, I can hear the angels. <laughs> Job, Job, Job chapter 36, verse 16 and verse 17. Uh, let me give you a little background uh, about Job, who was a very wealthy, well-to-do sort of a man, had a bunch of kids, had a wife, and uh, just large land holdings. He was the, one of the greatest men in the East in those days. And suddenly things started to go wrong. You know, somehow he, he didn't realize, he didn't know how to keep the devil out. And the devil got into his life and started to strip away from him, uh, you know, killed off his kids. And it was just a disaster, just a horrible thing. And uh, when everything was said and done, Joel was sitting on the ground. Uh, he was mourn mourning. Back then, they would put on uh, sackcloth, uh, just, I guess, to, as a sign of I'm mourning. Sackcloth is a very rough uh, material, as we can imagine, or sacking, and, and everything, and ashes. So they would take ashes, throw ashes in the air, and let it sort of come down on them. And that was a sign of saying, I'm mourning. He had three mates, uh, four actually, three uh, mates that came around, and we called them Job's comforters. And, uh, and these guys began to home on in. Every one of them had a religious spirit. And they gave Job a hard time and knocked him around and didn't help him at all. You know, sometimes there's some, some people that want to come around when you have a hard time. It's better for them not to come. If they have a religious spirit on them, they will do more harm than what they do good. And some people are just best kept away. Just love him, but love him from a distance. And... Uh, and, uh, but later on, you get to, in, in Job, uh, uh, you get to chapter 32, chapter 33, a fourth individual turns up. Many people don't know this. This uh, fourth guy that turned up was, uh, uh, I believe his name was Elihu. He had the Spirit of God on his life. He's the guy that made sense. He's the guy that spoke the truth. That's why in terms of theology, you don't pay much attention to stuff that these uh, previous three guys, because there is off, they're, they're off the wall, these guys, but... but um, uh, this other chap, he made good sense. And he said to Job, he says, Oh, Job, he says, Don't you see how God's wooing you from the jaws of danger? In other words, God has stuck you into the doors, uh, jaws of danger. God's trying to draw you out, he says. How he's drawing you into wide open places, inviting you to a feast 
at a table laden with blessings. That uses language a little bit like Psalm 23, where the Bible says that God has prepared a table for us in the presence of our enemies. Though enemies uh, uh, may be, but, uh, but God says don't ignore them. Just knock them back if they come too close and just enjoy the good things that God has laid out for us, which are all richly for us to enjoy. He says, And here you are laden with, guilt of the, with the guilt of the wicked, obsessed with putting the blame on God. Don't blame God. In fact, Job, with the help of his th three other mates, ended up blaming God. Um, and and uh, this, other, this fourth man there, uh, uh, Elihu was his name, says, don't blame God. He says, God is not behind your problems. Uh, in fact, blaming God will only cause our world to become smaller and smaller and smaller. Don't blame God. God has not caused your problems. God is not behind. God is not the architect uh, of, of your problems. God's the answer. All right, and so again, uh, 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 Job uh, uh, was told here. He says, "Look, he says that God wants to draw you into wide open spaces. Our life uh, should be bigger. There's a bigger world waiting for us to occupy." Let me now talk about some limiting forces and barriers in our lives. Uh, and this is by no means a complete list, but it identifies a few of them that some of you will recognize and others of you would have never thought about it. But, uh, but uh, let me just start with the first one there, uh, and I guess uh, we call it small-mindedness. Uh, the Bible would indicate that, uh, that it's grasshopper mentality. How many of you remember when the Israelites came out of Egypt um, under the leadership of, uh, of Moses there and uh, stood on the edge of the promised land? And that's where many people are, just on the edge. They're not, they're not fully uh, enjoying everything, but they're just on the edge, as it were. And so Moses sent in some spies to spy out the land. Uh, there was 12 of them, one from every tribe, 12 tribes, uh, 12 spies go in there, and they come back, and 10 of them said, oh, it is just like you said. It's just like God says. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's wonderful, marvelous. Here the fruit. They brought a cluster of grapes. Uh, carrying uh, th that thing on a pole between two men. They must have had some grapes back then. And he says, it's absolutely wonderful, but they said, we can't have it. We, they had a religious spirit on their lives. He says, we can't have it. Ten of them says, there's giants in the land. And by the way, if you want to rise up to new levels, there is a few giants that you have to fight off. As I said, Vanessa and I, we've met a few along the way, and we haven't finished slaying giants yet. We haven't arrived yet. All right, it's just knocking them out the way. By the way, I enjoyed that, Pete, when you did that before. A good friend of mine, uh, <laughs> uh, some of you know him, Pastor Jacob Samiri, did that once, and his shoe came off and it flew up into the air, and, and I thought that was awesome. Anyway, <laughs> lost my train of thought just then. <laughs> so these guys said, we can't have it, we can't have it. But there were two men that had a different spirit in them. One of them was Joshua, and the other man was Caleb. And God says, these two guys have got a different spirit in them. He says, they will go into my promised land. But all the other guys, he says, all of these doubters, all of these unbelievers, all the, the guys with the grasshopper mentality, they will die in the wilderness. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, Joshua and Caleb and the younger generation moved into the promised land, but all the other guys were kept out because they said, we can't do it. God, why did you bring us out? Uh, God, why did you put us into this wilderness? Why, why, why? You know, sometimes on our way to our really, really wealthy place, sometimes in, on our way, we've got to pass through some things. Uh, just don't camp there and don't, don't, uh, don't uh, make your permanent abode in the valley. You know, God, there's always a mountain coming after a valley. Just don't stay right there. Just keep on moving. You know, as they said, if you, somebody says, oh, man, I'm just going through hell right now. Well, don't stop. You know, just don't park and uh, just carry on driving. <laughs> Praise God. So they said, we can't have it. Um, and uh, they said, everyone we saw was tall. You know, it's, it's a sad thing in life, man. We know that there's people that are a bit taller physically than others. And, and, and you know, some people that you look at, they're pretty tall and, and everything. But, you know, physical size has nothing to do with this. Uh, I assure you, it has nothing to do with it. But if you look at other people, and even the ones that are shorter than you physically, if you think that they're taller than you in stature and in everything else, you've got a problem. You've got to deal with that problem. You want to you wanna just not, not uh, give in to that. Uh, so it says, everyone we saw was very tall, and uh, <clears throat> even the we saw the giants there, the descendants of Anak, 
And we felt as small as grasshoppers. And that's the problem. Many people feel as small as grasshopper. You're not a grasshopper. God's created you, my friend. And you're an awesome person. There's a great destiny waiting for you. Uh, and, and, and it starts by getting saved. It starts by giving your life to Jesus. And then it starts by doing what the Word. And then, then from then on, it's only up. There's only one way, and that's up, praise God. And, <laughs> and uh, he says, uh, we felt as small as grasshoppers. And that is how we must have looked to them. And I say, yep. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, your, your eye as big as how you see yourself, not as big as others see you. If you see yourself as big, others will see you as big. If you see yourself as small, others will see you as small. So there's something about that, that uh, we have to deal with grasshopper mentality in our lives. And by the way, I use that story of... Uh, of fleas earlier on, and I'm not suggesting that anybody here is a flea, and not in the remotest. That was just a story, okay? And uh, we are not f fleas, we are God's creation. We are created in the image and in the likeness of God. Uh, the psalmist said, he says, Lord, he says, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. He says, how marvelous is this? So, so uh, of course, religious, religious spirits will say, oh, you're just a worm. You're just a sinner, you know, and everything. But for, that's not true. You know, people are sinners before they get saved. But after they are saved, uh, we become the righteousness of God in Christ. We're sinners. We are now the saints of God. And don't, don't wait for somebody to canonize you and to, to you know, three, four hundred years after you've died and to some, suddenly declare you to be a saint. The Bible already declares you to be a saint. If you're born again, you're a saint. So small-mindedness, grasshopper mentality, put a knife into it and twist it and don't pull it out until it's dead and gone. Just absolutely, we, we, we speak of the renewal of the mind and allow some of these scriptures, even written in the victory program, to, to unlock and to demolish some of the limitations that uh, people carry in their minds. The next one is cultural limitations. Uh, many people have never thought about this, but uh, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. And you know, you know, culture is somewhat like the air. We don't see it, but we breathe it all the time. And people live in their culture and don't even know it's there, but they're, they're surrounded by it, they're influenced by it, they're locked in by it, they're, they're, they're bound by it. And uh, <clears throat> he says, don't become so well adjusted that your culture, uh, to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. For us, as believers, the primary culture is the culture of the kingdom of God. And everything else is secondary. Of course, I'm not suggesting that all culture has to be thrown out. There's some very good aspects to culture and praise God for it. And the very ones that think they have no culture got the bigger culture. All right. And so there's good aspects to it, but there's typically limitations built into the culture. In some instances, just nothing but designed to hold people down by some guy at the top that's designed the culture. And uh, <laughs> so he says, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you. This is what God wants from you. And quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out in you. Develops well-formed maturity in you. How about that? He says, like the culture, it always wants to drag you down uh, to its level of Im immaturity. And by the way, every culture in the world is immature except the culture in the kingdom of God. There's good aspects to certain, you know, most cultures, I dare say all cultures, good aspects to it. But some things absolutely, we need to just shake these things off and not allow ourselves to be bound by these cultural limitations. Uh, some of them are very restricting and very limiting uh, and to break out into a larger world, sometimes we've got to absolutely just break away from these limitations that are forced upon us. Um, people with racist problems are very small-minded people. Uh, they, they think no further than their own ethnicity. Yeah. Very small-minded. Yeah. Little minds. Reminds me of the fleas that we talked about earlier on. 
And, uh, and yet for us as the people of God, we recognize that God is called out for himself, out of every tongue, out of every tribe, out of every nation, a people unto himself. We are the people of God, and culture no longer matters. Uh, those barriers that were there before no longer exist. They've all been knocked down. They've all been knocked down by the blood of Jesus and by the name of Jesus Christ. No longer applies to us today. We're no longer bound by these things. In various other things, in some cultures, in some cultures, oh, how how bad is that? In some cultures, uh, the kids in any given family can, um, must not allow to do better for themselves than the oldest in their family, than the oldest son. And in some in some things, it's more rigidly enforced than in others. Well, that would be a sad world for me because my older brother, he's the nicest guy that you'd ever meet. Like like he's a man of peace. He's an awesome guy, but but uh, he's just he's just hasn't really done all that much with, with his own life in terms of. Of the capability that was there, still virtually within 45 kilometers of the place that he was born in. Uh, he's uh, just retired. He doesn't have a house of his own. And if I were locked down by his limitation, I would be very angry. I tell you, I just absolutely demolished that that silly thought. Whoever thought of it and say, I will not be bound by that. Thanks very much. My brother is a nice guy. We get on extremely well, but. Uh, I'm not bound and he's not bound by any such things. And so, so don't, don't accept things that are trying to crowd in on you. Just bust out. Bust out. And then in some places that uh, you can't get married unless, uh, unless you're in the role of the older one has to get married first. Well, says who? Says who? And there's just two little examples we could go on. And for some, some of you, you can do a much better job. Uh, uh, with your culture, I only understand uh, uh, you know, a little bit the culture that's invisible to me, and that's the Pakia culture is invisible to me because I'm in it. Uh, European culture is invisible. We, th- we have no culture. Yes, we all have a culture. There's aspects to every culture. Uh, and, you know, some, some of the uh, Kiwi culture is a bit more subtle than other cultures. Uh, but, you know, the culture that you got to go to the pub every Friday night and get smashed. I mean, what a, stu- what a stupid thing is that? <laughs> what, what, how, how stupid is that? <laughs> here's, an, here's another limitation force, uh, a barrier in people's lives. That's friends or family members who belittle you. I tell you, this is bigger in some families than in others. Uh, um, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17, and by the way, we're we are, we are closing in on, on closing shortly. So he says, Then I said to them, This is Nehemiah speaking, You see the distress that we're in, how Jerusalem lies waste, and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the walls of Jerusalem, that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which has been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. And they set their hands to this good work. But when Sambalat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and uh, Gishem the Arab heard of it, they laughed at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? So I answered them and said to them, The God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore we his servants will arise and build. But you will have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. Friend, there are some people who should have no right, no heritage, no memorial in your life. Because all they want to do is push you down. All they want to do is belittle you. So as soon as you share one of your dreams, they want to say, Who is, what is this thing that you're doing? Will you rebel against uh, our culture? Will you rebel against uh, established norms? And I say, yes. We want to absolutely rebel against it. We will absolutely not be bound by that. You know, Nehemiah came home uh, uh, came back to the country of his birth as a, as a, as a, as a, a governor. Uh, Jerusalem, the temple had been built by now, but Jerusalem as a city was lying in ruins and, and, and uh, you know, a bit indicative of people's lives that are just sometimes in ruins. And sometimes he just built the walls and built the gates and just, you know, and like two years later when, when things are rebuilt, it's like, wow, you know, this is a much better city now to live in than the one that I lived in before. And, uh, 
And Nehemiah, God had placed it on his heart to rebuild the city. He traveled around, uh, uh, looked at a task that was monumental. It was just enormous. There was uh, several gates and parts of the wall were absolutely demolished and torn down and everything. And, and you know, Nehemiah rallied the troops and he says, hey guys, we're going we're to build, he says. We're going to do something for God here. It is not right that the city lies in ruins and that enemies are trampling in and out. Well, wouldn't you know it, the first thing that happened was that Sam Ballot and Tobiah and Geshem uh, came and just began to ridicule uh, Nehemiah. Sam Ballot was a um, was a uh, a um, uh, from, was from Samaria. He had a, a stake in the ground there in terms of his own influence, and suddenly he could see that his own influence was going to wane and everything. And so he began to chide, he began to ridicule and everything. And then when that didn't work, you know, they had set up a trap for Nehemiah. Nehemiah was up on the wall, he was building. He had told these guys to build with one hand and to keep their weapon on their side. And you know, that's how we need to be when we are rebuilding our life. You've got to keep the word of the sword of the spirit just handy and just speak the word. And when something happens, just speak the word over it uh, and knock back the devil and knock back those uh, thoughts that will come at you saying you can't do it. And Nehemiah was up there on the wall and uh, so these guys had set a trap for him and here comes Sam Bell. He says, Nehemiah, we've got a better plan now. Why don't you come down and let's have a discussion. And Nehemiah says, I'm not coming off the wall. He says, I've got a great work to do. He says, go away and leave me alone. I'm kind of paraphrasing here. But you know, friend, let's always keep the high road. Don't go down into the muck with other people. If they want to criticize do names calling and muscling, let them do that. Don't join them. Sometimes it's best to not answer your critics. Sometimes it's just best not to answer your critics. Uh, I seem to have a number of them I have had over the years, and sometimes you just don't answer them. It's just hardly worth to get down into the muck, because as soon as you start to justify yourself, it can turn into a mudslinging match, and you just don't win in that environment. You can only win when you're on the battle. You can only win when you're in God's will. As soon as you start to criticize other people back and everything, you're losing the battle. So don't answer your critics, and don't let them uh, pull you down. Um, you know... Um, most of us have a Sam Ballot, a Tobiah, or a Gisham in our lives somewhere. Could be a family member, could be some relative, could be uh, you know, a friend. Vanessa and I uh, knew a couple years ago now, a lovely couple and, uh, and his wife or girlfriend at that time up in Auckland, and we traveled around there and spent some time together. He was an awesome guy. She was a lovely girl. They had some friends around of theirs, and the guy was, uh, that, 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 that friend that the, my friend had around was just a lovely guy, just, a, just a, a lovely guy, but his girlfriend, man, she was poison. Uh, she would just sit there, and you could see down here, she would just let him talk, and she would just sit there while he's talking. She would think of something just to, to belittle him and just to tear him down. And I looked at that, and I thought, I wonder how much long he's going to put up with that. Uh, this woman, just get rid of her. She's bad news. Like, uh, and, and I don't know what's ever happened because I never met him again, but, uh, you know, she had that Sam Ballard spirit in her. He was a nice guy. He wasn't perfect. Um, you're a nice guy. You're a nice uh, lady. Uh, uh, but we're not perfect. But we don't need a Sam Ballard to tell us how bad we are. We don't need anybody belittling us. Set your sights on, on things higher than what you've got to make right now and let nobody talk you out of it. Mark Twain. In fact, here, the next sentence there, do not let your critics determine your future. Don't let them do that. Do not let your critics shape your future. Don't let them do that. Mark Twain, um, he said, keep away from those who try to belittle your ambitions. Small people will always do that, but really great people make you believe that you too can be become great. How awesome is that? Great people you recognize, the ones that come and that, that want to lift you up rather than slam you down continually. The ones that want to put something into you rather than always take something out of you, rob confidence fr from you and put fear into you. Uh, don't let them do that. Uh, the next one there, I guess these points do tie together and there is some overlap there. But the last point I want to talk about, and this is a big one, uh, is unmotivated companions. I'm not saying evil companions. I'm not talking bad, bad, bad people. I'm talking unmotivated companions. See, based on the law of association, we become like those who we constantly associate with. The people that we hang, hang out with all the time, we much become like them. And you know, the reality is that uh, those closest to you, 
will largely determine how high you will rise. And there's a scripture here in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. It says, do not be fooled. Bad friends will ruin good habits. By the way, it's a good habit to be motivated, to want to go up in the world, to want to move on in life, and to do things and new things and fresh things and to step out. That's a good thing. But unmotivated friends will say, well, what do you want to do that for? Um, and, or somehow talk you out of it. And their very lifestyle will become a cumbersome burden for you and you won't be able to break out until you part company with some of these people. We love all people. In fact, sometimes um, it's sort of getting together with people and discussing issues and everything. And I, I usually counsel people and encourage people, say, look, you need to love all people, including your family. But sometimes you've got to love some of them from a distance. Create a little bit of distance uh, from them. And for some people, you just got to like just, you know, the, the, the more distance you create, the better it is. Um, I'm not suggesting that kids should run away from home, <laughs> but some adults' children will have to move away from the control of their parents if there is control there. If they're control freaks and they're still controlling your life today, you need to break the power of that and not allow it to function in your life anymore. Don't let them, uh, don't let them use guilt trips on you and because people who are controlling, the whole control manipulation deal, there's guilt, there's anger, there's intimidation and what have you. Break free from that. Do not let that happen in your life. Your heavenly father will not do it. Don't let anybody else do that to you. Proverbs 26 verse 4. Answer not the fool according to his folly, lest you become like him. And you know, hanging out with foolish people, and there can be a lot of fun, don't get me wrong. It can be a lot of fun, but if there's just nonsense after nonsense, after nonsense after nonsense, I get together with some of my relatives when I return to Austria, and, uh, and my brother give him, a, give him a couple of beers and a couple of drinks. I tell you, he's the funniest guy, but after a while, it's just, it just goes around and around. We're sitting around the same table that I used to be a part of, drinking the same beer, the same nonsense, goes around. Uh, I mean, how can you talk so much nonsense after hour after hour after hour? It just, it just wears me down. I just can only handle so much of it, and then I say, see you guys later. I'll, I'll see you tomorrow, and, and I'm off. I can't stand this, uh, this everything, and yet he's a nice guy. So, uh, you know, unmotivated companions will absolutely demolish any motivation that you have to do well for yourself, to go ahead in life. Don't let it happen. God wants to break that thing down. Um, and once you grow strong in yourself, uh, you don't have to necessarily move physically, but in some instances that might have to be necessary uh, to just get away from the control of that until you're strong, and then you say, it'll just not be happening. I put my foot down pretty early uh, in, uh, in, with my, <laughs> praise God, um, with my relatives that I, they call them in-laws, um, good people. But you know, certain things, I, I, I just, aspects of it, I said, I don't want that. It's just not going to happen in my family. We just, you know, we, we, anyway, praise God. I'm in trouble already now, so. <laughs> good people, good people. <laughs> David. Pray the bold prayer to God, and I think God wants us to pray that same prayer. And it doesn't have to be complicated. God's not looking for fancy words. God's not looking for a great oratory speech when we speak, speak to him, Oh, thou great God. Though it's good to tell God that he's great. The Bible says, Ascribe greatness to the Lord our God. But, you know, in terms of praying to God, David said, Hurry and help me. I want some wide open spaces in my life. And I'm just sensing an anointing right now that, uh, that if you want to pray this prayer, and I'm not you know, th saying that you need to pray it out aloud or anything, but if you think that you could do some with, with, with some wide open spaces, just lift up your hand a little bit and put it back down again. And you suddenly realize that your role is way too small. And, uh, and uh, see, this it just tells us that this is the right crowd for, <laughs> to preach this message to. And basically by your uplifted hand, you're saying, me too, God. Help me too, God. And, uh, and uh, I want some wide open spaces in my life. And I'm sensing an anointing. There's actually stuff going on even right now. Even as I'm winding down with the message now, we move on to just allowing God to just finish off what he started when we started speaking about this whole thing. 
to absolutely demolish smallness in people's thinking in their minds, to demolish uh, uh, guilt that has held people down, to demolish shame, to demolish whatever, whatever there is. And it's, I can't always articulate everything there, there, there is uh, uh, present in people's lives, but the Holy Spirit can. So just close your eyes for a moment and allow the Spirit of God to just sweep over you right now. I'm sensing right now that fear is absolutely dealt to. Uh, fear is leaving people right now. Just shake yourself a little bit if you think that that's you and just don't allow that thing to come back on you again. Fearful thoughts. What are people going to say? Well, so what? Who cares what are people going to say? You're going to rise up to a new level. Don't, don't give way to, to small, um, uh, limited thinking in this way. I'm just sensing that others of you, there's just a rearranging going on on the inside of you right now. As the Spirit of God hovers over this uh, uh, auditorium, over the people here, and to just undo some of the damage. Some of you, you've just been slammed down as a, as a, as a, as a child. Uh, parents didn't mean to. Praise God. You know, as parents, I know. We, uh, Vanessa and I have got four kids. You do the very best you can, but you can do damage along the way and not even realize you're doing it. And I believe that God's undoing some of that damage that's happening, that's happened. He's undoing it right now, this very moment. Just allow the Spirit of God to touch your life, and uh, some of you have been just, uh, some, some of you have just, you know, been messed around with. And, and uh, some of you have been used and abused. And in some instances, it's been, it's been, you know, those who are closest to you. In some instances, loved ones, uh, spouses, and everything. And, and somehow you've said, uh, I will never allow that to happen again. And by making a self-vow, you're keeping other people out that God wants to bring into your life that are good to you and good for you. God wants to undo even somebody's self-vows that people have made uh, and just lift that thing from you in the name of Jesus. Father, we release the power of God in this place. And I thank you, Lord God, the burdens are removed and yokes are destroyed. Barriers are torn down. Limitations are dissolved. And Lord, we want to move into that uh, wide open space that, uh, Lord, you have for us, the one that, that David talked about. And so, Lord, I, I just want to pray this prayer uh, on behalf of everybody here and say, hurry and help us. We want some wide open spaces in our lives. And I thank you, Lord, that you've already done so by your Spirit in the mighty name of Jesus. Just while your head's about and, and eyes are closed, I wonder if there's anybody here this morning, um, uh, the starting point for you to come into a, a wide open space is to commit your life to Jesus Christ. Religion is not the answer for you, but Jesus Christ is. Religion is a system. Jesus Christ is a person. The person of Jesus Christ died on the cross, and he did so on our behalf. He, he died sacrificially so that we don't have to be punished anymore for the things that we have done wrong, for the laws of God that we have broken. Jesus died on the cross, and if you accept him as your Lord and as your Savior today, you will be born again. Uh, you will be made brand new on the inside. All the stuff that's happened will be washed away, and you will begin a brand new life. Um, and that brand new life has no barriers. It has no limitations. We just bring those with us uh, as we go, but they will just dissolve one after the other after the other, and eventually there are no more limitations. And I wonder if you're here this morning, you will say, I know, I need to surrender my life to Jesus. I wonder if you just briefly lift up your hand and put it back down again, just to indicate, I see that hand. Thank you, sir. If, is there anybody else? Just lift up your hand. You're basically indicating to God that you want to be saved this morning, that you want Jesus to become your Lord, your Savior, your friend, the one that will come into your life and help you to live uh, in wide open spaces. Anybody here? Anybody else that needs to do that? Praise God. I see that hand. Thank you, dear lady. Praise God. Let's not rush. You know, sometimes it's just taking our time and just allowing people just get to that place of having counted the cost. You know, there is a cost attached to, to serving Jesus um, we need to give up our own life uh, and our own um, uh, selfish ambitions and live for God. But whatever we give up, God gives us back more than what we've given up and gives us all the good things, that are, all the things that are good for us. 
I wonder if we can all stand to our feet together. I want us to all pray this prayer out aloud together. Some of us have prayed it hundreds of times. It never hurts us to pray it again. We don't need to because we're already born again. But we're wanting to help those that have raised up their hand and maybe one or two others that have not responded. And if you pray this prayer out aloud from your heart, by the time you, you get to the end of it, your sins will be forgiven. You will be born again. Jesus will be the Lord of your life. So let's pray out aloud. Say, Heavenly Father. This is all pretty quiet. Let's try it again a little bit louder. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I surrender my life to you. I thank you that you sent Jesus to die on the cross. He shed his blood for me. And right now, I'm asking you, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Make me born again. I want to accept you as my Lord and Savior. Forgive all my sins and help me to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Somebody want to give a shout to the Lord and do one of them, one of them exciting things. Praise God.